I would like to uh, thank Asa for inviting me uh, and also, of course, as other co-organizers. Uh, I was worried that the theme of my topic is a little bit further away from uh, the conference. Uh, but this morning, Mike said that scalar curvature might tell something about the universe. So, so that gives me some new confidence about my talk. Uh, okay, so I will just I will be as like down to us as possible. I try to uh, make uh, my talk uh, accessible to everyone. So if you can ask a question, if there's something uh, you don't understand. Okay, so what is scalar curvature? It's a it's it's one of the same post. Uh, geometric invariant. So we start with a manifold, you know, with some measurement, which means a Riemannian structure. And of course, that tells us how to like measure volume. Okay. So we let's like measure the volume of a small ball with radius r. And compared to the volume of the uh, ball with the same radius in the Euclidean space, and here is a, an asymptotic formula. Okay. So so the error term, the Kp, is just a scalar curvature. Okay, so if if the scalar curvature is positive, it means the like volume of small balls is relatively smaller compared to the Euclidean balls. And if it's negative, then it's bigger. So it's it's like really you know the simplest geometric quantity you can uh, you can uh, get without doing much geometry. Uh, you know this formula, of course, is very elementary. Uh, but it's actually it's not that much useful in studying scalar curvature because uh, often the kind of question we ask are very global. This is a very local formula. It's difficult to integrate uh, this local formula. Okay, so uh, it turns out, you know, uh, one of the most powerful method of studying uh, this invariant is is a quantum method by which I mean uh, we need to look for the right operator, which includes all information about scalar curvature. Okay, and this is, of course, uh, one of my very favorite operators. It's very, very uh, elementary. Okay, so so here is the operator. Let, let's first look at the Euclidean space. Actually, you know, for the rest of this talk, I will focus on the Euclidean space. We don't really need to look at more complicated manifold. So we have one global coordinate chart. Okay, so we are looking for like a first order differential operator whose square is a Laplacian. Okay, now uh, let's think about the 2D case. Maybe oh, if I have some chart, oh, uh, I don't. But but it, it's it's essentially you know uh, in the two D case the uh, coefficient matrix is something oh thank you it's something like the poly matrix I mean very close not a, well I guess you know C one here I can choose this to be C two here to be like zero I I okay all right so so and. And if you square the matrix and uh, then using the fact, you get exactly this. Uh, but we, in doing the computation, let me emphasize, I need to use this closure formula. I think it's called, there's a name for that. Uh, I use Clarence formula, well, uh, a little while ago, my son was learning multivariable calculus. I learned the name. Okay, and this actually this is, is very crucial to us in order for this to happen. Okay, now in high dimension, you know, once you have this, this was the, the, the discovered by Dirac, and in high dimension, you know, in order to build uh, matrices like this, actually it takes some thinking. And the most efficient way of building, constructing matrices like this is using the so-called Clifford algebra. And that's that's the most efficient way. Okay, now I avoided talking about the Hilbert space. The Hilbert space essentially is the minimum Hilbert space on which this operator acts. So it's the, there's only one choice, not much. Okay, so now, now of course, this is a flat geometry, Euclidean geometry, and if we want to have something more interesting, and 
in in general for like uh, aluminium manifold, uh, we have to replace uh, the patch derivative by so-called covalent derivative. But you know that's a very natural idea, and of course the covalent derivative is compatible with Riemannian metric. So so we have have this Dirac operator. Again, let's focus on the Euclidean space. Now you ask the question, you know, if I square, do I get the Laplacian? But remember, in the Euclidean case, in order for the square to be Laplacian, we, you know, we need to use this formula. In general, of course, you know, the covariant derivative, they, they actually don't, they don't commute. And now, so of course that's a kind of quantum phenomena, but you know the obstruction to commutativity is exactly what the curvature is. Okay, all right. So so you expect you know, there is an error term uh, between the square and the Laplacian, and that error term should depend on the curvature. Now, if you sit down, do a little computation, the error term is exactly the scalar curvature. Okay, I mean. So, so, so this is really a quite beautiful formula. Okay, all right. So this establishes a, a connection between curvature and uh, and actually invertibility of the operator because the Laplacian we know it's non-negative, and if the scalar curvature is positive, then it's invertible. Okay, all right. Now you know the Dirac operator is a linear transformation and it's infinite dimensional. So. I mean, in the finite dimensional case, and uh, you know, we know how to decide when an operator is invertible or not just by computing its determinant. Okay, so, but in the infinite dimensional case, we have, don't have anything like the determinant. So we need another invariant. Okay, so, so this is actually, I consider this to be one of the most beautiful invariant in mathematics. And that's so-called the Friedholm index. It, it's it's a very simple invariant. It's about solving a linear system. Now, so so we take the difference of the dimension of the kernel. So the kernel tells us, like uh, you know, if the solution is unique or not of a linear system. The cool kernel tells us about uh, you know if the so solution to the linear system exists or not. So, so this invariant is really about you know, the linear system, whether we have solution or the, the solution is unique or not. Now, of course, the wonderful insight is to take their difference, because if you study this in two quantities separately, they are very unstable. But by putting them together, take their difference, it's a very stable invariant. If you make a perturbation of the operator, like make a perturbation of the coefficient, would not change. Well, you know, there's not so many <laughs> things like this in our life. You know, if you punch it, it would not change. Okay, now, and actually that stability makes this quantity computable. Okay, and you can like deform it and into something more computable. and. Oh, of course, I, I should remark this invariant is an obstruction to invertibility because if the operator is invertible, of course, you know, all the every term involved will be zero. Okay. All right. It's computable, it's a computable invariant, it's an obstruction to invertibility. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and compute this. Of course, that, that was classical work. I mean, you know, it was actually uh, the so called Atia Singer index zero. I mean, in general, for compact manifold, I mean, this can this quantity can be computed. It's it's a topological invariant, something like Euler number. I mean, you know, it's uh, so it's very computable. Okay, all right. So so in particular, if this invariant uh, is well, if scalar curvature is positive, then this invariant topological invariant has to vanish. Okay. All right. So so this is a classical part of the story. Okay, so, uh, and, but in the last 10 years or so, you know, this, uh, this uh, part of mathematics was very much revived uh, in uh, largely due to the work of Gromov and, uh, uh, and he, he thought this, this is an area of mathematics. It, he considered this to be an immature area, so which is, it's just in a very early stage of uh, being developed. Okay, so now 
now actually actually you know the motivation of studying scalar curvature actually came from physics so let me mention one oh uh yeah so uh it's uh, let me mention uh, one motivation, which I will discuss a little bit later on. So the so-called positive mass problem. Okay, but I I will jump into this. This uh, this is uh, a conjecture of Gromov. It's very elementary, very down to us. Okay, so which is is in some sense a very elementary but localized the version of the positive mass problem, but it's stronger than the positive mass problem. So the po positive mass theorem follows easily from this very elementary looking statement, okay? And so it's uh, just about uh, like a convex polyhedron in Rn, okay? So, so for example, you can think about a square uh, in, in the 2D case, a square. Okay, in R2. Uh, okay, so of course there is, you know, the Euclidean metric. The Euclidean metric, of course, has curvature zero. This means scalar curvature is zero, so far, so on. And, uh, and also, well, for something like this, the boundary, well, for the standard uh, Euclidean metric, the, the so-called mean curvature is zero. So mean curvature just measures how, how far you know the boundary uh, from like a, a minimum surface, so called, which minimizes like area, or well, in this case length. Okay, so now so Gromov's the so called uh, uh, it's kind of rigidity conjecture says that if you have another Riemannian metric on this polyhedron, and if the scalar curvature is greater than or equal to this, also the mean curvature is greater than or equal to zero, and also the dihedral angle. So this is an so-called, well, here, here you have 90 degree with Euclidean. So, so if the dihedral angle, what is the notation? It's theta, so theta. Uh, if c, uh, so if theta is like less than or equal to zero, okay? So if this happens, the so rigidity conjecture says they have to be exactly the same. There is no choice, okay? All right, let's 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 see this. This can be, uh, so all the scalar curvature has to be zero, mean curvature have to be zero, oh, and, and, and the so-called dihedral angle have to be the same. In this case, it's 90 degree. So, so let, 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 let's put this like in, uh, in this square case. So in the square case, so it's just a consequence of the gauss bonnet formula. Uh, if you look at the formula on the slides, the last line, uh, you see, well, in this case, the mean curvature is simply the so-called geodesic curvature. So this, I wrote at the, in the notation of uh, like mean curvature, but normally uh, it's just geodesic curvature. Now, every term by assumption, every term, the left-hand side is there are three terms. So each of the term is non, like, uh, of course, non-negative. Also, the last term, um, yeah. So, so the last term. So we have those angles. If this is equal to two pi, uh, then it's going to force you, and force all the angle to be like like ninety degree. You have, I mean, the first two term, you, it forces you to be zero. It's just by positivity. So it's a, just a simple consequence of the gauss bonnet formula. Okay, so, but in high dimensions, there's nothing like the gauss bonnet formula, okay? So this is when we need to use like uh, the Dirac operator. But before I, I go to talk about how to prove this conjecture using Dirac operator, I'm, I'm going to just mention like one of the consequence. Essentially, uh, the positive mass theorem of Xiang and Yao can be reduced like by a simple procedure to, uh, to this rigidity conjecture I just stated. That's what this is saying, okay. Uh, also, uh, it works in high dimension. Okay, so let me just mention a couple of known cases of this so-called dihedral conjecture. Gromov himself 
proved the, uh, the conjecture for cubes, and Charlie like proved this for simplices and and some other uh, cases. And but the proof uh, was done by minimum surface method, and the minimum surface method. So it's a completely different method, uh, uh, and has some dimension restriction. Okay, so so those are non non cases of the conjecture. Okay, so now I'm just going to outline a proof, and actually that. The outline, it's it's very, uh, I would say very natural, okay? But we, we actually struggled for a while. So the first step is how to involve the dihedral angle. Like, so if you have a high dimension, like, you know, you have a polyhedron like this, so, so you have the angle. Of course, this angle actually depends on where you are. So this we actually puzzled over this how to like how to relate to the to the dihedral angle in terms of the Dirac operator, and uh, we knew somehow the dihedral angle should pop out, but it it, it took like we took like quite a few months to figure how to make that connection, and so it is uh, essentially you know. It is it naturally appears in uh, this inequality, and the spiritual point is actually the dihedral angle should be considered as some kind of distributional mean curvature. And they, but we it took us a while to realize this point. So so if you look at the left hand side, uh, so because this polyhedron has boundary. So we try to, in a way, we just try to apply the Stokes theorem, okay? So, so when you have this term, you know, this is a polyhedron, D like applied to a function. So this is like, in a way it's just, you know, you, it's a just uh, an inner product that you're considering. So if it does not have boundary, you know, you can D self adjoin, you can put D on the other side, but it, it has a boundary. So it's a matter of applying the right Stokes scale, but because the manifold has corners, and when you apply the Stokes theorem, and it's much much more complicated, and when you do it very carefully, and the dihedral angle naturally pops out. Okay, so to do this, you have to do a limit process. So there are some work to be done. But actually, for us, the difficulty was more spiritual, and it took us quite a while to, to make this work. Okay, so you have the mean curvature. The mean curvature is relatively easy to, to, to appear, and, uh, but, but that's what it pops out. So the dihedral angle, like, like, yeah, appears as some kind of distribution of mean curvature. Okay, so so this is the connection of the Dirac operator to the dihedral angle. Okay, all right. So the next part is like, in a way, the hard part. Um, it so it, it took some quite hard work. Also, I should have mentioned this is uh, joint work uh, with Qin Ming Wang, who was my former student, and Zhang Xi. He, he is a young colleague in uh, Texas AM. Uh, okay, so, so, uh, and Gromov's conjecture has a natural assumption. And so, so I did not emphasize that the dihedral angle should be less than or equal to pi. Actually, if that's not the case, his conjecture has counterexample. So, so, so this was part of the conjecture has this, but actually to prove a relevant index theorem. Also, you need this assumption, and at first we did not realize this. Okay, so so this is a manifold with corners, and so in order to have uh, make sense out of like Fred Holm index, you need to impose some boundary condition. The boundary condition is some is the most natural boundary condition. So actually, our Dirac operator now is not on the minimum like. Uh, domain, so we like tensor the so-called minimal domain with itself. We take the tensor product. The boundary condition in this case, uh, in this case, so 
the bundle is can be naturally identified with the bundle of exterior product and the operator can be essentially it's the DRAM operator, but we, with a little bit different geometry on it. So the boundary condition, we just ask the forms to be tangential to the boundary. Okay, it's a very natural condition. And in this case, if we impose such a boundary, we can prove the index is just the Euler number. Okay, but this actually, this is uh, index theorem for manifolds with boundary is notoriously technical. Okay, there are a lot of work, for example, the work of Melrose, and but but we uh, but the existing work, it's uh, the boundary condition are all like global. So therefore, the index theorem are involved with secondary invalid. But our index theorem are only more involved with like primary invalid. We don't have any secondary invalid involved here. Okay, but this. This is the right index theorem for um, for to study this this uh, problem of Gromov. Okay, so now I'm going to outline. Uh, so so once we take this for granted, the proof is like a, a one line proof. Okay, so all the difficulty, I mean, goes to the proof of this index theorem. So so now let's let's prove the conjecture. Okay, so well for polyhedron. You know, the Euler number, of course, uh, it's uh, it's just just one. It's not non-zero. Okay. All right. So, so that means the Fred home index is non-zero. So we have a non-trivial section, okay, of the operator. So it's, it's a, something non, a non-trivial section phi. When you apply the Dirac operator, you get something zero. Okay. So now we plug that section into the formula. So let me just look at this estimate. So into this inequality. So on the left-hand side, it's zero because you know that's in the null space of the Dirac operator. But with that boundary condition, the third term is zero. So we are only left with the first term, second term, and the last term, okay? Now, by the conditions of this rigidity conjecture, each of the terms, well, of course, the first term is automatically non-negative, but you know, with 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 the condition of the conjecture, the second term is also non-negative, and the mean curvature is also non-negative. So each of the term is non-negative, but it's less than or equal to zero. So that means it has to be zero. So if it's it is zero, then every term has to be zero. Now, if if the first term is zero, I mean, it means this section is parallel, okay? So it cannot be, it's, it's non-zero at every point, which means, okay? All right, if it's non-zero, if the section is non-zero at every point, also by ellipticity, this section has to be smooth, okay? So then it means, you know, the C, the, uh, the C the IJ minus, yeah, I only need two means. I'm almost done, probably in one minute. Okay, so now because phi is non-zero, you see these two angles have to be the same and the mean curvature have to be zero because what else can they have? Okay, so that's the end of the proof. Okay, so, oh, I should mention that the John Lott, when the manifold has smooth boundary, and the dimension is even. Uh, so like it does not have corners. Uh, this argument is due to John Lott, okay? Now, of course, in this case, there's no dihedral angle. Now, kind of interesting that his argument would not work if the dimension is, uh, is odd, because normally, how do you reduce so all the dimensional case from the even dimensional case, you have to take a product with the unit interval. But if you do that, you, you have corners. So, so what I'm trying to say is uh, corners are very natural. It's, you know, even in the case of smooth boundary. And it, in this case, we, I mean, don't know how to prove a manifold with smooth boundary in the other dimensional case. Okay, you need to like, Really 
get into spaces with corners. Okay, so now actually there's a, there's a more general comparison theorem. You know, we focus on the polyhedron case because that's what the Gromov's uh, conjecture is about. Uh, but, you know, there's a, we can compare two like general manifolds and get a comparison theorem. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of inequality here, but, but it's just a natural generalization. I am not going to talk about this. Uh, I, but the main idea is about uh, the polyhedron case. Yeah. And, um, okay. Thank you. And thank you very much for the talk. We now have time for questions. Um, let me remind you, we have this new scheme. Um, question, if you have questions, please come down to the stage. And with that, you also give your implicit consent that everything is recorded, video and audio. This is uh, what I have to tell you. The other reason why we do that is, I think before it was usually not, um, uh, the quality of the transmission was not very good for the audience online and they couldn't see person asking the question. So please. Uh, I come, come, come yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need the microphone that, because you can use that one. Yeah. Please identify yourself. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Li Yuan, and I have a question regarding the like the spin spin bundle in uh, this case. Yeah. Because the Dirac operator requires spin bundle, but when we have the corner, how can we define the like the transition function and to get the spin structure of the manifold? This is. Oh, uh, okay. well, actually, this is a polyhedron. It has a global coordinate. If you wish, we don't need coordinate transition. So you can just use, so, so it's really the simple possible case. You can just use one coordinate chart. Okay. So you don't even, if you are worried about this. So I, I'm trying to say this is not a, an essential problem. So we don't have to worry about this. Okay. Uh, but but it's, it's not, it's even from a general manifold, it's not an easy, yeah. Yeah, it's just um, so that you're visible to the audience and to the camera. Okay, my name is Boris Jung, and I cannot resist asking what happens if you know something about Ritchie curvature instead of scalar curvature? Is there a similar program or does it not work at all? Oh, uh, I think you can, I should mention there is, uh, you can ask uh, like for stronger sequences, uh, consequences. You know, it's the Ritchie curvature zero, yeah. So, the, that can be actually derived from there, or, or even say, yeah, so they are stronger rigidity, yeah. Uh, but that's a good question, yeah. Are there any other questions, maybe also from the online audience? You, you mentioned <clears throat> connection to the Schoenier theorem. Is there a connection to Witten's proof of that theorem? Yeah, so I mean, in spirit, in spirit, that's uh, you are very right. Uh, so Witten has, I should have mentioned this. So Witten had the uh, Dirac uh, operate uh, approach to the positive mass conjecture. So, uh, but this is, this is a stronger like version. I mean, although it, some, a lot of times local versions are like weaker version, but the, yeah. But there is a spiritual connection, yeah, not, not like logical connection, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful talk. <laughs> oh, thank you, Asa, for the invitation, for the inspiring conferences. Oh, I, I should make a comment. I think, you know, although it sounds like what I'm talking about probably is not related to the main theme of the conference, but I, I strongly believe I, I get very inspired by talking to people at this conference. Uh, you know, classically, like, you know, big data, you know, because I, I work with a lot of topologists, uh, like, uh, so uh, many of them are working on big data using 
to part of metric geometry. I, I believe because they use like, uh, you know, quantum information, like quantum big data. I, I believe like quantum geometry should play a big role. Now for quantum geometry, what is the quantum metric? The so quantum metric, well, at least according to Alan Kahn, should be the use of Dirac operate. All the information are included in the Dirac operate. So in, I, I hope, you know, they are more developed like along those lines and more connections between different like groups of people. So also, yeah, so I hope one day I can work on things like that. <laughs>